Okay. Hello. Thank Hello. You. Welcome back from intermission. I hope you find your seat, find your beer. My, <laughs> my name is Sinclair Manning, also known as Major Merger. I am Brian W. Mulligan, also known as Astrobit. And we are here to give you this month's top news stories in astronomy. Yay, I pressed the button the right, time, right. right way this time. First up, a new name has been coined to describe moons that no longer orbit their host planets and instead orbit their host stars. So everyone, say hello to Plunits. <laughs> Woo! Hi, Plunits. So astronomers have like a pretty bad reputation of like making up horrible acronyms and stuff. And it turns out we're just bad at naming things in general, I think. Um, I actually learned today that there is a term that some astronomer made up to describe moons that orbit around other moons. Okay. I don't know if anyone could guess this, uh, but it's moon moons. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, now we have Plunits, uh, which is a moon of a giant planet, and under circumst uh, certain circumstances, uh, the moon can abandon its original orbit and become a satellite of the host star instead. So the former moon is then unbound and has an orbit more similar to a planet, ergo a Plunit. Free the moons. Free the moons. <laughs> <laughs> So Plunits, and all exomoons for that matter, uh, have yet to actually be detected, uh, but astronomer Mario Susarquia and others believe that they may produce light signatures that telescopes could identify according to recent models that they've done. So they found that if a moon is circling a massive gas giant planet, which is close to the host star, uh, the gravitational tug uh, between the planet and the host star that's put on the moon could be enough to kind of eject the moon out of its normal orbit and send it, uh, you know, flying away to eventually then orbit the host star. Um, so while some planets could potentially sustain these orbits around the stars uh, and maybe accrete enough material to then become a small planet eventually, uh, most, it seems, uh, will have short lifetimes disappearing within a million years after leaving their planetary orbits, either because they end up colliding with their original host planet or the host star. Um, or they might get ejected out into space entirely. Uh, but fingers crossed that one day we will detect exomoons and plunits and that this funny little name sticks. And, and moon moons. <laughs> and moon moons. <laughs> plunits and moon moons. <laughs> All right, uh, so the problems for the Mars InSight uh, lander continue. Uh, so there's a heat probe, uh, also known as the mole, that's decide, de designed to hammer itself uh, into the surface of Mars down to a depth of about uh, three to five meters, where it's gonna measure the interior temperature of the planet. Um, so far, it's only made it about a foot down, or 0.3 meter. Uh, it's been stuck there since March. It's been a while now. Um, so one of the possibilities is that it's encountered a rock that it just can't get through. Or the other possibility is that the soil is just not firm enough for it to kind of grip to, for the hammer to, to hammer itself further in. Um, so you can see a video here. Uh, what we're seeing is, here's the uh, arm of the lander. This is the thing that kind of like placed the, the probe onto the surface and uh, you can't, oh, there it is. So I'll, I'll wait for it one more time here. You can see, uh, maybe not. Okay, sorry, I thought it was in this video. The, pro, the probe is, itself is like right down there somewhere. You can't quite see it, but um, they've taken some pictures of it. Uh, they found that there's a shallow pit around the probe itself that suggests in fact the soil might be the problem itself. Um, so one of the things that they're considering doing right now is using the arm and a scoop to try to push down on the soil and just kind of compact and firm the soil ar around the probe so it can start hammering itself further down. Uh, so all help is not yet lost. Um, the purpose of, of this probe in the first place is to, like I said, to measure the interior temperature of Mars to find out 
whether Mars gets warmer if you go deeper in, like, the, like it happens on Earth, or if it gets cooler as you get deeper in, essentially de determining whether Mars is heated by radioactive elements in the interior, or if it's simply heated by surface heat from the sun. Uh, if it's heated by heat from the interior, that's, very, that's more promising for the possibility of life existing on Mars still, because there might be pockets of, of heat and liquid, uh, liquid water somewhere beneath the surface where life might still exist. Hopefully, hopefully that's the case. All right. So using both the Atacama Large Millimeter Array and the Very Large Telescope, uh, both of which are in Chile, astronomers have imaged the cold, rock-strewn rings encircling the planet Uranus. So rather than observing the reflected sunlight from these rings, ALMA and the VLT imaged the millimeter and mid-infrared glow naturally emitted by the frigidly cold particles of the rings themselves. So the rings of Uranus are invisible to the human eye um, and all but the largest telescopes, and they weren't actually even discovered until 1977. Uh, but these new images, uh, which you can see are on the left, uh, allowed a team of astronomers to measure the temperature of the rings for the first time, which wound up at a chilly 77 Kelvin, or 77 degrees below absolute zero. Uh, so the rings of Uranus differ from the more well-known rings of Saturn uh, in that Uranus's main ring is composed of golf ball size and larger rocks, whereas Saturn's rings have a broad range of particle sizes um, from micron-sized dust to rocks that are tens of meters uh, in diameter. So uh, Imke de Pater, a uh, lead author on the study, also notes that the rings are compositionally different. Uh, and unlike Saturn, they are really dark like charcoal and are very narrow, uh, with the right, widest ring being only about 100 kilometers wide, where uh, Saturn's can be tens of thousands of kilometers wide. Uh, so to date, astronomers have counted 13 rings around Uranus, um, and future JWST observations will provide vastly improved uh, observations of the planet, its rings, and its atmosphere. So there might be more rings out there, we just haven't found them yet. <laughs> Are the, are the, do you know, are the rings close together or are they widely separated? I think they're, they're so there's like the main rock, like large rock pebble rings. Okay. And then there are a couple of thin dust lanes in between. Okay. But they're pretty, okay. they're all pretty close. Okay, all close together. Yeah. All right. Neither of us are planetary people, so. No. Thank you for knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so my last story uh, ever. Ah! I wanted to go in with a bang. So, uh, talking about a failed supernova. Uh, so, the star that you see in the very center here is a uh, particular white dwarf. It was observed by a team led by Roberto Radi of the University of Warwick. Um, and, and his team has identified three stars that may be remnants of a certain type of failed supernova called the supernova type 1AX. Um, the team included J.J. Hermes, who you see here on the lower right. Uh, he did his PhD at University of Texas. He graduated in 2013. Really nice guy, good friend of mine. Um, so uh, the, the stars that they identified are white dwarfs, which are essentially the cores of sun-like stars uh, after they've used up all the hydrogen and puffed off their, their outer layers. What you're left is with an, an inner core of, of just carbon and oxygen for the most part. Uh, these stars are about the size of Earth. They have temperatures only a tad warmer than a Texas summer, about 10,000 to 100,000 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> Uh, the stars that the, the team observed are peculiar in two ways. First of all, they're moving really, really fast, hundreds of kilometers per second, uh, or in context, going from here to the moon in about an hour. A little faster than the Apollo group. Um, and then they also uh, showed through their observations that these, these uh, white dwarfs are unusually rich in heavier elements, uh, such as neon and magnesium, uh, cobalt. Um, and to, to some extent, this isn't necessarily surprising. Uh, most white dwarfs, like I said, are carbon and oxygen. Um, and the most massive white dwarfs consist of oxygen, neon, and magnesium, much of what these, these consist of. Uh, however, uh, there's, there's no explanation for why there's cobalt. And these stars are only a tiny s fraction of the, of the mass of the sun. They're only about two-tenths uh, the mass of the sun. So they're really, really, really small. We would expect them to be composed 
probably of helium, uh, if not carbon and oxygen. So the presence of these hybrid elements is, is unexpected. Um, one explanation for this is that the stars exploded as supernova. So a type 1a supernova is a white dwarf that reaches a certain size and explodes, and it creates a lot of iron and these heavier elements, um, but a normal type 1a supernova explodes and completely obliterates the star. There's this very specific class of, of supernova that don't quite get there, that, like special circumstances happen, and it doesn't completely explode. It mostly explodes, and you get a little bit left. These might be some of the first stars that we've seen that are evidence of, of these type of, of uh, supernova occurring where you get something left behind. Um, my last page. So the, the, the far stars identified this team all seem to have the, the right properties. Um, the relative abundances of the heavy elements don't quite match the expected values. Uh, however, given these stars are the first ones identified that, that might be remnants of these type of explosions, means that we, you know, these are our first observations of them. We've got our theory, we've got our observations. Now there's going to be a lot of work bringing those together and figuring out is this really the case or no? This is a completely different thing we've never seen before and we don't know what's happening yet. So stay tuned. All right. So, finally. Astronomy not in the news. <laughs> uh, Aaron alluded to this earlier, but yes, AstroBit and Major Merger bid farewell to AOT ATX. This is my last show and Ryan's last show for different reasons. Uh, it just so happened to coincide on the same uh, month. Um, but yeah, so I am a going on fifth year graduate student now and I was lucky enough to uh, be awarded a travel grant which is going to allow me to travel to Copenhagen, Denmark for the fall semester and I will be living there. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'll be at the Cosmic Dawn Center and, and maybe learning a little Danish, eating some Danishes. Uh, and whatever else. Drink, drinking some beer. Drinking some beer. Um, but yeah, I'll be back in 2020 in the new year, so you'll, you'll probably see me again. Maybe not on the news, but definitely around AOT. Just taking a little break. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, so I've been here. Uh, I've, I've, and one of the trivia questions was who's been here longest? Uh, if you know me, you probably guessed it was me. Uh, I've, I was friends with Jeff and Rachel when they started Astronomy on Tap uh, ATX. Uh, I've been, my first talk was I think our third show back in, what year was that? January of 2014? I don't know, I've lost track of time now. Um, Ironically, that talk was about time. Uh, but yeah, so I've been around for a long time. I've been doing news for about three years. Actually, Sinclair joined me, what, like three or four months after I started doing news. We've been a great Yeah, great I was, was going to say, initially I thought I was going to end in August, but I'm actually happier it's this month because I started with you and now oh, we're, was we're it, ending Oh, was it this together. month exactly? Oh, that's perfect. I don't perfect. know if it's this month exactly, but at least same partnership. Oh, yeah, so that's true, together. that's true. <laughs> So uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've loved doing this. Uh, partly I feel like it's about time to just kind of hand it off to the next generation of, of, of students. Um, partly uh, my time this, this fall is going to be a little more cramped. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at St. Edwards University here in town. So I'll be teaching an astronomy class there. Uh, if your kids are looking for a place to, to go to college and take a really good class from a really good professor, Go to St. Ed's. Um, but unfortunately, it's an evening class, so it's going to be, and it's Tuesday night, so it's going to be a little bit hard to, to be here. Uh, but we're going to be handing this off to some very capable hands. Uh, Jackie and, and Sam, uh, who you both have seen uh, up here before, are going to be taking over for us, and we think mm -hmm. they'll, they'll do a great job. So thank you all. <laughs> thank it's you all. It's been wonderful. <laughs> We, we have a question. A question in the news. <laughs> we don't usually do that. I don't think I want to answer that question. <laughs> I do wear something underneath, so. And I do only wear it on Astronomy on Tap Nights. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs>
I promise I'll wash it before the semester begins. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. This has been a lot of fun. Um, enjoy the rest of the show. Enjoy the future of astronomy on tap. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you. <laughs>